have a great group of talks about some high yield topics, inpatient der or dermatology, outpatient dermatology, general dermatology, and then a lipids talk from Arita, which is very exciting. Um, so answer, ask all the questions that you have about derm today, um, and then lipids. So um, we're going to get started with Dr. Colvin, who's one of the Harborview dermatologists, and I'm excited about this. Great. Thanks, uh, Nikki, and thanks for uh, arranging for us to do this. I know we kind of skipped around on dates a little bit, but I, I'm, this actually works perfect for us because uh, Mary Malam and I are working together at Harborview. Uh, and uh, so we've had plenty of time to <laughs> corroborate uh, and coordinate. Uh, full disclosure, this talk is uh, going to be given at the ACP conference in Boston in a couple of months. So if you happen to be going to that, skip this one because this will be basically the same thing. Uh, I um, want to give you, is, this is a lot of material, and I know you hate to hear that at the beginning of a talk, but it's all very digestible material. So just kind of let it flow. Uh, you know, if you find yourself scribbling to take notes, I'm happy to provide, a, you know, the kind of written portion of the PowerPoint slide. There are some, some pearls that I think are worth remembering, which you may not remember uh, you know, without seeing it again or writing it down. Uh, okay, let's see if I can advance this. This has happened before with when I've had a pause here. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and then reshare because I think I've kind of frozen up. But let's try that again. Okay. There we go. And let's see. There we go. That's better. Okay. No conflicts. I just uh, want to tell you my background because it's not that different than many of yours uh, and certainly not Dr. Alon's either and several of my colleagues. Um, I was a University of Washington med student and then a IM resident here and then for a year spent a, a chief resident here at Harborview where you're gonna see that that's where I've spent most of my career. Um, I spent a couple of years as a general internist in the Department of Medicine and then went on to do a dermatology residency at Duke before I grew 11 digits on my hands from being so inbred. Uh, since residency, I've been on the faculty and that's coming up on 28 years this summer, uh, with the exception of two years where I was uh, in Cape Town on a sabbatical. Um, I have an interest in HIV Durham and I really wanted to see what the impact of HIV was in a country that was not yet controlling things. Um, I've spent a good bit of my time as the residency program director and then have interests in systemic disease, dermatology, med medical education, as well as HIV derm and telemedicine. Uh, just, <laughs> I, did, I, I did not get introduced to Harborview at this point in time. This is like the 1920s when Harborview was freshly built as a, this Art Deco uh, huge hospital on the hill, quickly filled up. Uh, but I have been at Harborview long enough to see this profile, which shows the same Art Deco building overlooking downtown and looking towards the south to uh, Beacon Hill and a few extra wings on it at this time. Our former dermatology clinic used to be right in here on the third floor of the south wing. But since that time, all of, as all of you now know, that, and work at Harborview, it's a, it's a big campus and growing bigger. And there's another huge bond issue that's passed that's going to expand it even further. So it's it's really been um, a great place to work and, and a very important part of our community, I think. So my objectives today are to uh, first describe the diagnostic approach of what I'll call the skin turnist. That's those of us that are internally medicine based and then have an interest in skin disease. Uh, acknowledge and reflect on what you already do uh, in terms of diagnosis, management, and referral of skin disease patients, and then hopefully at least get you to aspire to, if not, frankly, advance your skin turnus skill set. All right, I'm going to start out with some simple hacks. I guess that's redundant, uh, but the hacks do uh, aid with dermatologic diagnosis. This applies to anybody. Um, first off, skin exposure is important. That seems uh, sort of um, like... Why do I even need to mention that? And I'll show you why in, in just a moment after this slide. 
Uh, good lighting, always a good thing. Uh, those of you that have come to work with us at Harborview will notice that we are lucky enough to have all of our exam rooms on a, on a windowed room. We're, we don't have any internal rooms that we use except for our procedures. Uh, so natural lighting is, is best. And you can always carry a little flashlight with you to get into those places where the natural light white can't reach. Uh, so, and they're very cheap. I have found magnification to be helpful even before my eyesight started to require me to wear glasses. Um, and, but don't, don't buy a dermatoscope. I, I reluctantly have a dermatoscope in my pocket and I use it. I guess I could borrow all the residents nicer dermatoscopes that work with me, but I find myself not really making decisions based on my dermatoscopic findings. And, and honestly, for someone who's not doing it full time, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste the money on, on getting a dermatoscope. I would though get a hand lens, uh, which is much smaller, much cheaper. And, uh, and really helpful to get sort of surface definitions sometimes where it makes a difference between whether you decide to refer biopsy or observe a lesion. And then uh, I know at, at Harborview and Adult Medicine, you have access to a microscope in KOH. I don't know if that's true at other sites. Uh, we do too in our clinic. And doing KOHs is really handy because it's really a very crisp path uh, you know, divide so that, uh, you know, if you confirm that you have a fungal infection, it's, it, you don't, you're not treating with anything else, but antifungals, uh, in general. So, uh, being able to distinguish, uh, a scaly rash as fungal or not is really handy. And then obviously, hopefully you're all, uh, using Haiku and using your phones as, as, you know, uh, HIPAA compliant cameras. Uh, for taking pictures. This is really, I think, revolutionized being able to uh, handle things that maybe weren't, aren't quite acute. Uh, you can get e-consults now. Uh, you can, you know, send pictures in advance of our seeing a patient. We can, it really helps us triage uh, patients a lot. So please, please use the system as it's already designed. Uh, this is what I was referring to earlier with uh, this patient who I saw who clearly has a leg girth difference. Uh, her right leg is clearly much bigger than her left. I should say thigh, but you can't, you can't see her leg, but she, it actually started with only her allowing us to see her skin from the knee down. And we clearly saw this discrepancy and we said, we got to see more. And so it took some time to coax this young, uh, anxious woman to show what was going on further up. But this isn't, every day that this happens, but this is why skin exposure is important. Uh, this happened to be in South Africa. This is a woman with as yet uh, uh, undiagnosed HIV with um, just a uh, very advanced Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, cheap, that, that price of these uh, lenses have, has gone down. Uh, 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 this single lens 4X from Bausch & Lomb, you can get for less than 12 bucks. Uh, so I highly encourage you to get this um, and, and don't worry about any anything else. A dermatoscope uh, is up to like 1700 bucks and the ones shown here are not the, not the high end versions. So don't waste your time. It's not a tool that you're likely to use consistently or, and, and, it, and it, since you're not using it consistently, uh, you may not be using it well. Okay. Let's uh, talk a little bit about diagnosing like a skin turnist. Uh, here's what I'd like you to try to learn uh, in your training and practice with respect to diagnostics and dermatology. Um, one is to recognize that inflamed skin looks differently in different types of skin color. So uh, I'll show you some examples of that uh, in a moment. Second is, uh, as opposed to what we're usually trained in, in internal medicine to history first, exam second kind of approach. In DERM, there's actually an advantage to an exam first approach, uh, not hearing a, a possibly adulterating history before you actually make some uh, differential diagnosis in your own mind with just visual exam. And we, we have this as part of our training in our residency program. Uh, second is to accurately describe skin lesions, and I'm not going to get really all, uh, you know, arrogant about using the term maculopapular. I, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. 
but you should know the other terms too because they're easy to learn and uh, sort of a universal language used around the world. Uh, learning how to do a punch and shave biopsy uh, from the body and limbs, I think would be a good goal in your training and, and future practice. Uh, and if you're good at that, you can do the face too. You can do this. Uh, so um, if you get to the point in your training where you haven't had the chance to do a shave or punch biopsy, then we probably need to confer and at least take you through one or have a video set up so that you can see how that's done because it's not hard. Uh, collect a specimen for KOH would be a, a great thing to know to do. It's not That's not hard at all. But then also confidently interpret the KOH prep. You can do this. And then lastly, uh, using the ABCDEs, you've probably heard those terms for description of atypical pigmented lesions and looking for the so-called ugly ducklings. And I'll show you examples of that. So here are two kids with the same disease. Uh, one has more melanin in his skin than the other. And you can see how the difference in these two more biliform rashes appears uh, in different colored skin. In the right-hand side, this child is lighter skin and you see the redness much more vividly than you can in the child on the left who has darker skin tones. And you see, you, you make out bumps that have slight pigmentation difference and maybe some redness if you squint. Um, it takes some experience and training to recognize red in darker skin tones uh, if you're used to uh, seeing it predominantly in white skin tones. And unfortunately, uh, you know, textbooks aren't necessarily very helpful because they've traditionally uh, had more photographs of the lighter skin tone patients with uh, inflammatory conditions as opposed to darker. That's getting better, but it's not, it's not, it's not equal. It's similar to the background in my slide going from light color to darker color and trying to read the same uh, color of the title slide uh, here. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a similar sort of uh, um, issue. This is um, a normal, uh, it's a micrograph of normal skin showing the um, epidermis with the stratum corneum up here at the top, this kind of basket weave appearance. And you'll see the melanin in this uh, normal skin is predominantly in the basal layer. In fact, most of the melanin in everyone's skin is located within keratinocytes. It's produced by melanocytes and then get, gets quickly handed off uh, to keratinocytes to form these little caps above the nuclei within keratinocytes to help protect these dividing cells from UV light. Um, this, this is sort of an anti-cancer protection little umbrella. So this is someone with probably light to uh, you know, slightly darker skin tone. And here's someone who has more heavily melanized skin. And you see how heavy the pigment is in this micrograph compared to the other micrograph. And then here's some, uh, just a, a stretch of clinical pictures showing these same things. These two uh, kids have the same condition. They both have atopic dermatitis. You notice you have this, the colors that come out in the lighter skin tones are, are more red and more hyperpigmented in darker skin tones. And you see that here, the antecubital fossa, where you see red with excoriation here. Here, this is more lichenified and hyperpigmented here. But you can definitely make out lichenified and hyperpigmented here, lichenified and um, red, cracked, et cetera. So it looks different. Not saying it's harder or easier in this particular condition, but it, there's clearly a difference in appearance. But you know, if you become experienced with this, you don't get fooled by this being a different condition uh, in, in children of, of, with different skin tones. Um, when darker skin tone becomes inflamed by a condition, a lot of that melanin that was in the epidermis gets dropped out as a result of the inflammatory response. We call this pigment incontinence. Now, it's not as if there is no pigment left here. There still is. You're just not appreciating it as much but what you can see why now you have two layers of, of pigmentation in, um, in darker skin tones and an inflammatory response. And that's why you get that um, inflammatory related hyperpigmentation. 
uh, these two patients have the same condition. A uh, person has uh, lighter skin tones on the right-hand side, darker on the left-hand side. Same patients, this showing their feet. Um, these patients both have syphilis. These patients have psoriasis. Uh, you probably would have figured that out from either one of these slides, but you can see how the uh, kind of salmon pink color and the sharp demarcation really jumps out at you. It, it eventually jumps out at you with the patient up top. It's just, uh, it, you know, it doesn't hit you over the head quite as much as the lighter skin tone. So having some experience with darker skin tones allows you to appreciate these differences and, and make diagnosis more, more accurately. Uh, this patient started out with a red, uh, uh, more biliform uh, condition, quickly sort of transpired that he, he went on to develop skin sloughing as due to TEN, toxic epidermal necrolysis. This is in our own burn unit. This was by day four. That first was day one. So it happens quite rapidly. Similar scenario, here's a patient who presented to us with painful and to his eye, red skin. And I think we could appreciate that, but it, it, it's not quite as evident as the other patient. Then you see sort of a telltale um, kind of warning sign here of this uh, uh, starting to become disastrous. This patient in a few days um, had disappearance of his skin. More the more same, this examinous process could be atopic derm or mammular dermatitis. Here's a patient who has nodular scabies. Uh, and if this were lighter skin tones, you might appreciate the reds much more. And then it goes the other way too. Uh, darker skin tone doesn't always hide things. It can actually accentuate things if a condition, for example, involves hypo or depigmentation as it does in this patient with vitiligo. And comparatively, these patients, uh, this patient on the right, this adult, didn't even know he had vitiligo uh, because the contrast was not clearly as much. It, it's not it's not particularly subtle, so I'm not sure what why he missed that. Um, this patient has also relatively subtler findings due to uh, depigmentation in the background of lighter skin tone. And then as a double whammy, this patient has uh, vitiligo. Uh, his natural skin color actually is on his cheeks, and that's all he has left after a very, very severe uh, uh, case of vitiligo. Um, this man is Micronesian uh, and he typically has darker skin tones given that uh, his heritage uh, as was, you know, came to the equatorial parts of the Pacific Ocean. Um, skin, darker skin tones were of an advantage. Okay, so uh, I wanna make sure that you appreciate those differences also and realize that there's inequity in terms of uh, uh, representation in textbooks of uh, skin of color versus um, lighter skin tone. Okay, so I'm gonna um, go through just like a little uh, sort of algorithmic type diagram to show you how dermatologists think and how you might wanna consider thinking when you're approaching someone with a dermatologic condition. So here's a patient I was called about initially uh, without seeing him uh, from an ED. This is while I was in training in North Carolina where there's a lot of poison ivy that grows uh, seasonally and uh, people are mowing over it and airborne contact dermatitis to poison ivy is very common. There's a lot of people who have allergic reactions to poison ivy. So I would, this, this patient was billed to me as having airborne contact dermatitis in, involving his face, uh, causing eye swelling to shut his eye and then this uh, sort of uh, weepy, crusty rash on, his, on the forehead. But we notice right away when you see him, this was not pointed out to me over the phone, that it's only on one half of his face and on the tip of his nose. So that clearly gives it away as something else. Had I heard that from the provider, I might've been thinking of something else other than airborne contact dermatitis. But, but because the history given to me was in my head first, it made it hard to get over that um, non sequitur hump to uh, to get to the true diagnosis, which you all know is B1 zoster. So uh, what I'm using this patient to illustrate is in dermatology, we like to look first and ask questions later or hear history later, uh, which isn't always easy to do. I mean, uh, pa patients don't 
usually like us kind of looking right at them first off. You usually want some conversation first, but uh, it, it helps to be able to get your own impression first, because otherwise I wouldn't have had two thoughts about this, uh, this patient. So this is what our sort of whole diagram for how dermatologists think and how I'd like you to think as a skin turnist. We start up here in the upper left with a physical exam. And, and the first thing you try to do is identify what the primary lesion is. And if there are any secondary changes, lesion patterns or distributions, and I'll talk about secondary changes as well as primary lesions. You develop a differential diagnosis in your head. Uh, then you might insert some history to see what gets eliminated or supported by in your, your morphologic differential diagnosis. And then you come to a clinical diagnosis. And then the rest flows, but I'm not gonna go over that. I'm gonna just focus on this part here. So let's talk about uh, primary lesions. Primary lesions come in a number of different types. There's macule, papule, nodule, tumor. And you've heard these terms before, and they're, they're, not, they're not difficult terms to use. And, um, and using them accurately, I think, is really helpful. Uh, if you can use these terms accurately, descriptively in, in a note, uh, it almost makes haiku uh, you know, um, un, unnecessary. But it is nice to have pictures as well, because there's some subtle findings that can occur afterwards when you start talking about secondary lesions. Secondary lesions are things like scale, crust, fissures or cracks in the skin, ulcers. These are things that didn't appear initially. They may have appeared as a process, as the primary process sort of played itself out. So for example, even something like pyoderma gangrenosum, which you generally see as an ulcer, it's not the primary lesion so much. What it usually starts out as is an inflammatory papule nodule or, or even blister. Uh, so eventually, as the process plays out, it may become ulcerated. So these, these are these terms that are, are useful to know. And, and you, can, you can learn this language and you, you can use it accurately. So for example, here are secondary changes of like hennification. There's also the post-inflammatory pigmentation we were talking about earlier. This is primarily a plaque, okay, with crusting and maybe some superficial erosions on the surface in a re relatively irregular shape, and it's sort of a, a dull red color. All right, switching gears a little bit. Uh, this is how you collect specimen for doing a KOH when you're suspecting you might have a fungal infection on your hands or in this patient's hands. After getting that scale collected on a slide, you put a cover slip over and just like you did in whatever biology class you might've taken in high school or college, uh, in this case, you're gonna put some potassium hydroxide underneath the slide or on top of the specimen before you put a cover slip on it. Let that heat up a little bit if you can. And if you don't have a Bunsen pipe burner, you can use a thick lighter, which we have in our clinic. Uh, probably best not to do this with a gloved hand because you don't want to melt the glove and burn your hand at that time. And it's also hard to start a big lighter with the gloved hand. After just heating that up, just to, just to make it warm, just to speed up the process a little bit, hopefully you'll be looking at a KOH that looks something like this, where you have these long streaming hyphae uh, that as you move your fine focus up and down, uh, becomes refractile and uh, really is um, very makes it a very easy diagnosis to make and treatment is really straightforward. Onto a slightly different topic, uh, pigmented lesions. Uh, the, these are the ABCDs uh, and E's of, uh, of pigmented lesions. And honestly, you know, you don't necessarily have to think about these. If you just look at all four of these examples, your gut just says cancer right away. And if you're talking about a pigmented skin lesion, you're 99.99% of the time talking about a melanoma. Uh, so it doesn't, your gut hits you with this before you have to go through this um, sort of mnemonic here. But it's it's helpful and it's something we teach patients who have a lot of pigmented lesions to, to look out for is um, these changes. Here's a good one in terms of the E, the evolution or enlargement. You see a lesion here taken with a photograph at some point in time, and then later on, this clearly changes, and you have this 
this one here is a reference to know exactly where you are. This clearly has changed, and for that reason, I would do a biopsy. Uh, this is showing sort of uh, the classic ugly duckling rule for someone who has many pigmented lesions. You want to look for the one that looks different, okay? Uh, and people who have multiple uh, nevi, for example, so, for example, or uh, seborrheic keratoses, a lot of them, what you're looking for is something that just doesn't match the others. And that can sometimes come as a bigger and hyperpigmented lesion. It can be a hypopigmented lesion, but that is less frequently. Or it could frankly just be a solitary lesion all by itself that, you know, when someone has almost no pigmented lesions. That doesn't automatically mean you're going to do a biopsy or refer someone for this, but it just might raise your suspicion a bit. Okay, let's get into some therapeutics. Uh, just, I want you to appreciate what you already do uh, and, and are very comfortable with. All of you have prescribed systemic antibiotics. Maybe not for skin condition yet, but you can do this. I mean, this is, this is automatic for you. Prescribing systemic steroids for someone who has an asthma exacerbation or any number of things. You guys have done this many times. And we do this very commonly in dermatology too. For example, in someone who has a raging atopic dermatitis flare and we want to cool this off quickly, we use systemic steroids all the time. Uh, we use systemic steroids in the hospital with you all when we have someone with pyoderma gangrenosum and we want to try to get control of this lesion that is threatening a limb or you know expanding very quickly. Topical steroids, you might have a little less experience with, but I want you to get comfortable with this because um, there's a lot you can do with topical steroids, and we'll go over that a little bit. You've probably prescribed uh, systemic antifungals and probably even topical antifungals in your prim primary care clinics. Uh, topical and systemic treatments for acne, which includes a lot of systemic antibiotics, but other things as well, and I uh, touch on this a bit more later. And then all of us know how to do something for itch systemically. And uh, um, a lot of us reach for diphenhydramine, but a lot of you know that hydroxyzine is also uh, viable as it are the less sedating antihistamines, cetirazine and um, loratadine. Methotrexate would be a great aspirational drug for all of you to get to know because there's so much you can treat with this, both in dermatology and in the rheumatology world, as well as other specialties. So um, I... I love and respect methotrexate, uh, and I, I want to um, empower you to learn to use this medication because you already prescribe things that are more toxic than this, uh, and this this is a very useful medication. Um, on the right hand side, these may be a little bit more aspirational, but not really. I I think I'll tell you why in a little while why I I recommend that you get registered for eye pledge and become a prescriber for isotretinoin, also used to be known as Accutane. Um, there, there's, there's good reasons for this, and uh, I'll tell you in a, in a few minutes. Um, also, a lot of you have already used liquid nitrogen on something like a wart or tin keratosis or a skin tag. I want to applaud that and, and have you realize it pays well, and you don't necessarily care about that right now, but procedurally, uh, this this can pay a lot of bills in your practice, so don't don't discount it and consider it uh, being part of your practice. Using a curette, and I'll tell you what that is if you don't know, and then uh, prescribing a sauna suit, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. So here's some um, simple do's and don'ts of uh, topical steroids. Steroids come in strength classes from a class one to a class seven. This really encompasses hydrocortisone over the counter, 1%. Uh, and I was just mentioning this to um, one of your colleagues yesterday. If you become comfortable with a representative steroid in, in class one, four, and six, just one, that's, that's three, three creams or ointments, uh, you're going to be miles ahead of people in your comfort with using topical steroids. And here's a few do's and don'ts about that. Uh, it mostly has to do with, you know, you don't want to treat fungus with steroid. It doesn't really, doesn't help you. Uh, and then on some parts of the body, you really want to use stronger because weaker is not going to do anything for you. So that's mainly like the hands and feet uh, where you might have uh, you know, 
um, a, an examinist reaction or contact reaction. Um, right. This is a patient who had a fungal infection treated with steroid, and it did make it less itchy for a bit, but it this just allowed the fungus to grow wildly. And so this has just kept spreading. If you do a KOH in this, it's going to be very abundantly positive. And what vehicle do you use for steroids? Well, I, uh, or any topicals, I often leave it to the patient to help me decide because some people want more greasy and some people want less. I'm using creams and ointments predominantly for in terms of topical steroids. Uh, we're talking about acne products. We're usually into gels or creams, depending on you know what the patient's preference is. Uh, we have solution-based uh, steroids. Not, not many of them. They're not greasy, but they're great for hairy areas. Uh, and then less commonly, uh, lotions and, and foams, which are often not covered by insurance, so I'm not using them as much. And there is one sort of uh, steroid impregnated tape, uh, which I think I've prescribed exactly one time in my career. How much steroid or topical should I prescribe? Uh, you know, you, you can estimate the body surface area with a rule of nines or taking the patient's hand as, as a 1% of their body surface area and then trying to estimate According to that, uh, another fun fact is that 30 grams of a topical covers an average adult size one time. So if you multiply that times 60, uh, that would give you twice daily for one month. And that may be useful for you or not. There are only a few things that come in large quantities, like one pound quantities. And whenever I say that to one of the medicine residents rotating with us and they've not seen that quantity prescribed before that get a bit of a, a chortle, but we prescribe one pound quantities a lot uh, in our clinic, sometimes two one pound quantities. And you will see us do that in the hospital as well. Uh, and then um, what, you know, practically you can start with what you think is a reasonable quantity, touch bases with the patient and make sure that they haven't run out in like one week or two weeks. And, and then also course correct to make sure they're not overusing it because they don't need to put it on like a layer of cake icing. It could be just very, very thin, pushed out to as far as it goes without um, losing sort of a little bit of a greasy feel to it. Um, a very brief treatment ladder for uh, acne, and this is really to get us down to isotretinoin. Um, these other things, You've probably prescribed before, maybe not so much spironolactone, but I would encourage you to consider this. We're using it usually in young women, not men, because it's um, uh, not generally useful. It could be useful for men, but it causes side effects that men don't usually want, like breast enlargement. Um, but in women, it's great uh, because uh, it is is one time of you know, not that many where women have a distinct advantage in acne treatment. They get spironolactone or OCPs that can help, uh, whereas men men don't have this. Uh, okay. This advantage comes back to women, though, for isotretinoin, which is a known teratogen. Um, that's why you have to sign up for iPledge in order to prescribe it. It's a monitoring program. And why would you even consider isotretinoin? Why would I even push this? Uh, one, it's uh, it's an amazing drug for people who have already suffered a lot with um, scar-inducing acne. Usually this is a younger age group, which is uh, sort of not your typical for a, a, a internal medicine practice. And it's nice to be able to chat with younger people sometimes when your practice is um, predominantly older individuals. And the effect of this on a young person or, or not so young person's life when it works well, and which is most of the time, is amazing. And it, it's, it's such an impact. You've seen the, the occasional patient who has had scarring acne and they live with facial scarring the rest of their lives. And it's not, it, it's not good. And, and it could have been prevented. And this is a point where you could prevent this. Um, and so you often end up with very grateful patients. You can do this. It's very, very gratifying. Dr. Colvin, can I ask a question quick about doxycycline? Absolutely. Um, my understanding is like there's both an anti 
antimicrobial effect, but also potentially an anti-inflammatory effect of doxycycline. And I've run into it sometimes where people, you know, we are moving so far away to chronic antibiotic or regular antibiotic prescribing and like, where are, are there kind of, how do you approach risks of doxycycline? Are you okay putting people on it for long periods of time? Does it more like, is it more for a flare? Or can you tell me a little bit more yeah. about your approach to that? Yeah, yeah, no. Well, you're right. And and certainly, I mean, we used to put, uh, you know, teenagers and young adults on doxycycline. And they'd be on it for years. Uh, and not that, that it wasn't a problem. It just like we, we weren't as um, attentive to, uh, you know, global um, med- medication resistance, the antibiotic resistance. Um, fortunately, doxycycline is a pretty narrow spectrum antibiotic. Uh we probably, you're right, we, we probably are using it more for anti-inflammatory effect because we also use it in things like rosacea and bolus pemphigoid, conditions we don't really associate with bacteria. There probably is some bacteria, antibacterial a benefit in acne, um, but I don't think we understand that very well because we're usually talking about uh, skin commensal bacteria that are normally there. Uh, and their role exactly in acne is not quite clear. Um, so typically we are usually considering doxycycline for periods of like three to six months. Okay. And don't, if you're going to prescribe doxycycline for acne, don't do it for a couple of weeks, like you might for an infection. It's, 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 it's for, it's intended for longer use to get, to gain that anti uh, inflammatory benefit. Um, but I do explain, you know, that because patients are aware when you're prescribing a longer term antibiotic, I explained we were usually going for shorter terms. This is usually the first medication we're going to try to take away as you improve. And we're going to hold you with other things, tretinoin, and in women, spironolactone, OCPs. Uh, and, uh, or we're trialing it before we uh, you realize, okay, this is not clearly enough for this patient who's going to need something more. And that would usually end up being isotretinoin. So I, it, is, it is a concern. It isn't concern, and I would just the figure of like three to six months might be something you just sort of hold in your head for this this one, and also realizing compared to um, you know uh, agricultural use of antibiotics, uh, the use of doxycycline probably is not a half a drop in that huge ocean of antibiotic resistance threat. Did I get to your get to your question? Yes, thank you so much. And okay. then there is one. I'm not sure if you can see the chat. There's a question oh, in the chat. Yeah. Thank about you um if you use a combined oral contraceptive with drosperinone a fourth gen progestin like slind is there any yeah. additional benefit of spironolactone or is that redundant uh no i don't th- I, I think there would be uh spironolactone is pretty uh you know it it is working uh at more of an anti-androgen uh receptor level and i don't think it's going to necessarily be um unuse unuseful in in its redundancy um so i i i don't i think there's use to spironolactone uh in addition to any any ocp um including that one thanks for bringing that up and and i I, i'm not looking at the chat right now so i don't i don't see it if there are other questions please interrupt okay um i think i sort of told you about my love for methotrexate i'm going to skip over this just so I can get to a few more things. And then I'm going to stop exactly on time because I can do that. Um, this is a liquid nitrogen canister. It's expensive, but uh, if you think you're going to use it for those three things, acne, uh, excuse me, warts, AKs, and skin tags, uh, do it. It's worth it. It's just a one-time cost. You will have to pay for uh, liquid nitrogen delivery because you can't just you know get that from your tap. Uh, but it it is it is worth it and and easy to do. This is illustrating on the right hand side using an ear otospeculum uh, as your sort of target. You can put this over a skin tag or any of these other lesions if it fits, and spray right into the speculum. And you're usually looking for about ten to fifteen seconds of frost time. Uh, that doesn't mean continuous liquid nitrogen, but it means keeping it frosted for fifteen seconds. Let it thaw and then repeat a second time after about a 30 or 40 second thaw time. Um, really, really useful for these things. And I would love it if all of you took on those three conditions and and really only refer those where you have a question about 
whether it is one of those things or you had really resistant warts or you worried something's a, not just an AK, but it's getting. Okay, and then kind of last, last useful tool I'll talk about is a curette. I, I love these things because they do so much. You can pare down calluses and corns. Uh, we get pay, people coming in for warts on the feet and they actually end up being uh, corns, also known as clavi. Uh, and you you sort of dig these out with the curette and where they were coming in limping, they go out like skipping. They just, you know, it's amazing what what they can do. These are very useful tools. They're very sharp on one side uh, and and but very safe in use for sort of um, decalusing um, lesions or doing some light debridement uh, because they are so sharp. We also use them for treatment of superficial skin cancers like uh, superficial BCCs. And they're very cheap. Okay, and the last, I think I'll make this on the last slide. Uh, this is a sauna suit. Uh, it is right out of the 1980s uh, in terms of its style. It's, uh, it's used for uh, conditions when someone has a very diffuse rash from the neck to the ankles. Uh, you would presumably cover the involved areas with large quantities of triamcinolone, for example. Uh, sometimes people even put on a layer of moistened pajamas and then put a sauna suit over the top of that. And someone can actually walk around their home like that. And they're getting this sort of uh, occlusive, this sauna-like effect, which allows the uh, skin to stay hydrated and allow more of the medicated uh, product, whatever you're using, to penetrate into that rash. It's this can be remarkable how quickly this works. And we've used it in hospitalized patients as well. So this is what a sauna suit looks like. And when you see us recommend this in our consult notes, you'll, you will have seen it here first. Okay, I think I'll stop there so that you guys get your break and then um, hear Dr. Alam's talk, which I'm looking forward to as well. I'm happy to entertain a quick question or two. Uh, and I really appreciate um, being able to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Colvin. Lots of high yield information in there. Um, we have probably a couple minutes for questions. If anything comes up, if you want to put it in the chat, I can read it out loud. Um, I have ordered a sauna suit at Harborview. They come in limited sizes, though. So finding an extra, yeah. extra large one was. Um, yeah. Someone had to go digging in the basement of Harbor. It's, it's a problem for a really for a bigger patient. Uh, it's okay to use a larger size on a smaller patient, though. Uh, it can be baggy, you know. And I like the comment about Halloween costume for this year. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Well, if anything comes up, please write it in the chat. We really appreciate your experience and teaching. Um, for everyone else, let's take a five-minute break and come back at 9.50.